Hello, hello everybody and welcome to the LJL officially unofficial cast where we're going to be covering the last four games of week two of the LJL. I am your host Alex, otherwise known as Lexi. I go by on the internet as Mars One. I am of course joined by my colour commentator and my play-by-play -play caster. I'm not, I, I should probably call you the same thing, commentator or caster. Regardless, it's initialize and Nightmare. Please introduce yourselves. Absolutely. So our first game of the day is going to be Detonation Focus Me versus Axis. Our second game of the day will then be Rascal Jester versus Detonation Focus Me. Following that, we'll have the Fukuoka Softbank Hawks Gaming versus Rascal Jester. And then to end our day and the matches, it'll be Axis versus the Fukuoka Softbank Gaming Hawks. But first of all, let's talk about our first game that we have for the day, which is Detonation Focus Me versus Axis. Now, these this is currently the top standing team and the other bottom standing team. And it's just how so happened worked out that way because the other group of four from week one didn't actually have an undefeated team. So this is a very interesting narrative. This is already somewhat following our own personal assumptions in tier list unintentionally. Yeah. Yeah, it's been really interesting to see Detonation Focus Me just continuously play basically whatever they want to play and they they they're just playing on a, another level some would say. Initialize your thoughts on the DSM, uh, DFM versus Axis matchup. T TSM. Oh God. Mm. And that was something that we do believe is a missing element for a lot of these uh, LJL teams. Uh, there's definitely some picks that have gone underrated, potentially over the next week or two or maybe three. We might actually start seeing uh, people opening up their champion pool to some capacity. Um I wonder, uh, Axis do seem to be one of the few teams who are throwing a lot more at the wall. Do you, do you expect them to keep throwing at this element? falls apart so i'm looking for a lot of fundamental improvements on the basic elements of the one through one gameplay from axes makes sense that does make sense initialize any other thoughts 
Uh, Axis bot lane are going to have to be very careful. Utapon and Gang have been playing exceptionally well, and uh, their bot lane has been put under a lot of pressure. Their first game versus V3 was an absolute whitewash in 23 minutes. They got dived, they had Nocturnes and Echoes, and Nautilus is turning up on them. So it wasn't easy, but if they are going to draft things like a Syndra or an like an Ash, they do have to be a bit careful that they don't get punished for it. Interesting thoughts from both of you. Well, with that in mind, I think it's about time that we start going in game. And as we do the classic LJR official, I'll do the count in for the game of three, two, one. Good luck to both of the teams and good luck to my commentators. Hopefully we won't need it, but I take it anyway. We're straight into champ select, but let's run down some team rosters first. So for detonation, focus me. It's Ebby in the top lane. It's Steel. It's Seros. It's Utapon and Gang in the bot lane. And for Axes, it is Unyan in the top lane, Hoglet in the jungle, Gariaru in the mid lane, Hyde as the bot laner, and Corporal as the support. And surprise, surprise, no one is letting Seros have his Heimerdinger again. That's off the board, and Elise is too, along with the Syndra. Potentially quite sensible when Axes have shown they're willing to put it bot and look okay on it. Yeah, so I think Elise is definitely the champion which allows you to play through the top side of the map. And I think Axes showed that when they pick the Kale in their day at day one games, they can definitely play towards that kind of style. It's not going to be allowed today, though. The Elise very quickly banned off the table, as is the Jarvan. And that's another pick I'm pretty happy to see because yeah, Steel, Steel had really some good on Jarvan. Um, and it set up for a lot of DFM's big team fight combos, but that's going to be off the board alongside the Akali, which is still pretty strong on this patch. Yeah, um, eventually going to get nerfed on 10.4. We're on 10.2 right now, though, so uh, we won't be seeing that. Uh, just out of priority yet. Still 100% pick ban presence as far as I'm aware. Just coming through to this last ban now from Axes. See what it's going to be. Yeah, it's a rumble. rumble. Okay. It makes some sense too. It's we... another good uh, blind pick in both mid and uh, at mid top and even support we've seen. And it's the set first pick. Okay. Taken straight away. We've had our concerns <laughs> about this, but it's also been a pretty strong flex pick. We've seen some very good set performances too, so I can't yeah. knock it too hard. Yeah, thumbs up to you too, set there. And it's actually going to be the Mordecai's and the Aphelios locked in as some very important power picks on the red side of the rift there. Yeah, it's the first. Please know it's the second Mordecai's we've seen. We have seen Ninja pick it up once, but couple. it didn't look not yeah. great success. But of course, Mordecai has been a very strong pick across the globe. Well, we've I'm, seen a yeah. lot of power out of his dueling and also his 1v1 death realm shenanigans. Well, so I think um, the thing about Mordecai into set in particular is that if uh, if set is going to try and set up for a jungler. Oh, is this going to be the Dragon's lock in? It is going to yes! be the Dragon's. Yes. Steel has the oh, Dragon's. So one thing from the first uh, 12 games that we've cast uh, is the, the one thing which I've taken out of it is that Where's Gragas been? There are some really good Gragas players in the LJL, and we're really uh, seeing some criminal undervaluing of the fat man in the jungle, although Steel has brought it out finally, so good stuff from him. And Utapon's gone towards the Misfortune, which has done pretty well into the Aphelios lane, but of course those two picks are both very strong. Gariari now hovering the LeBlanc, definitely a bit of pressure for him in the mid lane if that's where he decides to go. Yeah, absolutely. I think LeBlanc is, uh, it, it's definitely having a lot of priority right now, but it, yeah, if you don't pick a support, I think, um... Does get banned away. Yeah, if you, you pick the support here and then you try and ban out stuff like Nautilus and Leona, probably, with the Misfortune, maybe something like the Time Counter as well, depends what your, uh, flavour of competition is you're going for. Was that a Flay plan there in that? Was that, uh... Not intentional, but I'll take it, sure. Good. I was thinking more along the lines of a Dark Passage being pretty good to get the Immobile Aphelius out of trouble. Uh, and Blitzcrank out of the way oh, as well, yeah. because Gang has yeah. said he's willing to play that, and another thing that Aphelios really doesn't like is being grabbed by a rocket. Yeah, absolutely. I think while we don't have any dash ADCs in the meta right now, and Lucian not really being picked up in the bot lane, even though it does have some uh, presence around the world in solo lanes, uh, means that these hook champions are just very valuable against the uh, no dash AD carries in the meta right now. And yeah, okay, so the LeBlanc's been banned out. It's a very good blind pick mid lane, and we know that a lot of the mid laners in the LJL like to default towards that pick. Seros actually is a pretty good uh, LeBlanc too, though. He is indeed, and of course, it's just a strong pick in general. I can see if they're thinking okay, about going for something else and don't want that first pick red side. They'll get rid of it. The Leona gone as well for that ridiculous combo that Misfortune and Leona can pull off if they're not careful. Yeah, Leona is just kind of the unkillable support right now. Gets really, really tanky with the W and the Aftershock active, especially with the Aftershock changes over the preseason, which makes people who build more tanky stats get more tanky in turn. 
There's also an element, right, that if a solar flare even, like, partially lands for a slow, in Misfortune is so ready to throw down a bullet time and make people oh. suffer for it. Rek'Sai taken off the board, yeah, though. Yeah, so Hoglet's first two games were on Rek'Sai. I haven't seen anything else from him yet, so he'll just have to stretch the champion pool just a little bit. Oh, I've locked in the Karthus! All right, I quite like this, actually. So, Karthus being one of these uh, heavy farm junglers, because we do assume that this is going to be a jungler. We don't see too much Karthus mid nowadays. Definitely been a shifted towards that uh, jungle position so yeah it just allows you to gank it <clears throat> gank every lane at once with your ultimate uh has a lot of pressure into the mid and late game you scale really well on the cart as compared to a lot of other picks yes you do and of course with the Le Le leona rather i was gonna call it illusion which was a bad mm -hmm. idea the uh nautilus okay, now being nautilus. picked for misfortune in the bot lane as well so that'll be a strong 2v2 and we'll see what their last pick is here. Probably a mid laner, but of course Set can still get flex there, so maybe possibly. I don't think. Yeah, priority. unless you're gonna pick like a blind pick for the mid laners. Oh, is Ziggs. they are hovering the Ziggs. This would be another like unique champion to only Cyrus. This guy plays a lot of random stuff. It would be really fun to see it, but he's hovering over a couple of things as well. Karma. Going back to the Karma, another one of his uh, flavor pocket picks. And I actually think potentially with a set who might struggle to get in sometimes, adding another little speed up on top mm. is quite a helpful little touch, <clears> similar <throat> with the Nautilus. So I'm kind of okay with that. Might keep the Misfortune a bit yeah. more alive as well. Yeah, absolutely. And when you have like, even when you well, talk about you the... Uh, ooh, so Tristana mid. Okay, I'll uh, just talk a little bit about that then. So Tristana, we've typically seen this from players who want to play into something which is a little bit hard to displace from the mid lane, like a Rise or something like that, because Tristana does have a little bit better early consistent damage compared to a lot of other mid laners, because at level 2, you can jump forward with your uh, your rocket jump and your explosive shot as well, and uh, try and just all in with the ignite that you take as well. You really try and go for that kill lane and scale as this uh, mid lane AD carry. So a discussion that I think we've been having over here on the LGL unofficial kind of around podcast and stuff is what's happened to Lucian in the solo lanes and we're kind of seeing why is the Tristana being picked over the Lucian what's the strength of the weaknesses compared to picking something like Lucian which is surely in a similar kind of role as an AD carry mid. Uh, Tristana has slightly better matchups into a couple of different control mages Karma and uh, Ryze I can imagine being two of them well Ryze we've seen historically Karma I haven't actually seen that matchup too much but Tristana just allowing you to jump forward at level two with a bit of CC as well because you do have that slow when you land on them with a rocket jump and you just have way better wave control for less mana. Uh, That's Lucian has, yeah, Lucian's wave clear, although it's pretty decent. Uh, you do need something like an Essence Reaver to really uh, have your mana sustain be okay going into that. So yeah, we're seeing these full team compositions now. Another interesting draft from DFM with the Karma mid. Not many teams prioritizing that kind of pick, but also Axe is picking out some unique stuff for themselves. Oh so yeah, I'm, I'm looking, forward to, I'm looking yeah. forward to that. I'm looking forward to all of this. I think yeah. we've got the we've got our two sovereigns of death. We've got Mordecai, of course. And we've got Carthus being picked yeah. up there for the top side of Axis, which I'm quite excited to see how that works out. Oh, I mean, got, got the Phantom debuff from TFT. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see how a Requiem, whether that pulls off some serious damage against these teams, whether they can get through all the shielding of Karma. But we'll get into game and we'll find out exactly how that plays out. Game on. Okay. And that's an interesting little bit of a graphical glitch there. We've got <laughs> Champ Select, which apparently is the Rift. Uh, they're going to quickly f switch off that screen. Uh, we'll see <laughs> where this ends up now in game. Yeah, who needs all the uh, you know the important stuff like actually seeing the map? Looks like they're still in game, still moving their mouse around stuff like that. But we don't get to see it just yet. But when your overlay is that good, why wouldn't you want to see all of that? That's a very good question. But yeah, so one of the interactions I really like to. Um, highlight is uh, as we are back onto the main screen now is this uh, set versus mordecai's a matchup because there is a couple of interesting mm. things we can happen with that tell me so, more so set is a champion which really likes to set up for his jungler has the face breaker and the zero stopper for quite a lot of extended cc but if you're against a Mordekaiser and Set's job is to set up for a jungler, Mordekaiser kind of invalidates that because, well, you know, he turns a 2v1 into a 1v1 because of his ultimate. Yes, indeed. And that's a nice little face breaker start for maybe to get a bit of a punch on here. And Hoglet is going to come up and support his slightly beleaguered top laner there. Yeah, I was going to say, actually, is Ebby going to go for a little bit of a... I wondered if he was going to proxy a little bit of that wave there. doesn't go for it. He's just going to go wander around and see if he can think about interrupting that red buff start maybe but no heading back towards the lane now as gragas and steel here uh do manage to clean up their red buff pretty swiftly pretty early 
Yeah, and we'll we'll have to see what um what the farming mechanics are like for Hoglet here on this Carthus. There are a couple of things which can help out your early clear. Um, starting on the red buff, of course, not starting on the blue buff. It gives you a little bit more of that HP sustain, but might be running a little bit low in the mana department. Indeed, and I think that because, as you said, that face but that face break is a really interesting first start. There, it's not the knuckle down, it's not the haymaker. It allows him, uh, him to get on top of the Mordekaiser who wants to come and farm the wave, trade while he hasn't got his combos available to trade back. Yeah, I think that later into the game, this Mordecai is going to do really well into the set, but he is just being dunked on a little bit here. He's under half HP already. He's not got no pots left as well. That's a bit of an ugly spot for Unyan, who just can't get to this wave. Level 2 now with the Haymaker as well, so even if he does manage to walk away from the initial break, yeah, he's going to start horrible. stinging. <laughs> so he's actually out of range to aggro those back minions, which is why you can trade so hard there. Normally you'd want to uh, stay out of range of those minions, so you're not taking any wave damage as well. But yeah, he's he's trading really well in this top lane and denying Unyan a lot. Lots of CS. Yeah, that's that's some good early learning there from everybody. We've known him as a really strong laner for a long time now. And it's good to see him kind of showing that again. For Unyan, though, he needs to just sort of hope that this yeah, wave eventually gets shoved in. All in from Galliado, but Saras just running away with the uh, the little shield. But even with him running away with the shield, that's still about half HP from a couple shots and an uh, explosive charge. Yeah, and one thing to note as well is that if you put the explosive charge, you jump on them, and then you finish off that explosive charge with your autos, it does actually reset your uh, your jump timer as well. You can see you can get a bit of a double hop there. A lot of Tristana mechanics to keep, uh, keep track of if you're uh, so interested. Indeed. Well, I'm going to see what we can do with that. But while that's happening, uh, Steel finds himself a ward, and Unyan is forced away from this tower. This is so harsh. Oh, he's this not even so level harsh. three. Yeah, he's missing out a full piano wave here. He's two levels down on Ebby. This is real damage control from Axis. And Ebby even looks like he might be trying oh, to... Oh, he missed that one as well. Missed that last yeah. CS. And there, here we go. Ebby's just like, hey, buddy, how are you doing? <laughs> Steel's got level three. He's just picked up the Rift Scuttle. Is uh, ready to cause some trouble in this top lane. Looking like they're setting up for a dive. Union at least has hit level three, so that's something. But there is a flash body slam. There's Ebby here with a face breaker. He's got the face breaker stun as well. Oh. It's so easy. That's some good stuff. First blood now. Who's going to die though to the tower? No, the oh, haymaker shield. shield. The haymaker. Oh, fantastic cooldown tracking from Ebby there. So what happened there was the face breaker tagged a minion on the other side of him to get the full stun duration from that E ability from set. Great CC locking into a first kill onto Unyan. Flash conceded from Ebby there, but you'll definitely take that because it's the teleport over there on the other side used from the Mordekaiser. Yeah, that is some rough stuff. It's 16 CS to 5. At least Unyan finally gets to have a wave uncontested. But it comes at the price of his life, it comes at the price of levels, it comes at the price of first blood. Yeah. Let's look so at this again. We, we already saw that Unyan was respecting the dive initially, but then basically another wave comes in. As we said, that minion on the other side just managing to get that stun up there. Ebby flashing away from the turret shot just to buy him that half a second to get the, the W shield back up and available. Very, very well played from Ebby. Yeah, but all this while, Hoglet has been farming super hard. He's, third yeah. he's got 37 CS and level 5 already. I'll take the first blood from Gragas over it for now, but of course, we have got to keep an eye on that Karthus ticking time bomb. Yeah, so actually one of the things which might be quite interesting in this game again is so uh, Karthus has this kind of game plan of, well, at least if the team fight's going wrong, I can kind of go into my passive. Right. Ebby has not got a flash. He's been slowed by the wall of pain. He's getting a takes trade. a lot of damage there. The Conqueror did get stacked onto Unyan. Ouch. Yeah, but the thing about sets is that you do have really high base regen, and that's increased by your passive, the lower the, your uh, HP gets. So, you know, not completely in the worst of spots here. So we can see actually already up to about half HP as well, just because set has a, an interesting passive. Indeed he does. He's got the double passive between that pit grit stuff, and of course his increased... of um. What's the name? It's the Vestayan here. It's Valerian, I'm thinking. This is not Game of Thrones. <laughs> no, no. Uh, thank, no thank, dragons thankfully found not. here. Um... Oh, but, there are, there are, there are a couple. Okay, we're looking at you yeah. a pretty big CS lead here for Hyde and Corporal in the bottom, 42 to 27. Yeah. Probably in part because DFM had to play safe with their top side playing so aggressive, but it has come at the cost of a CS lead. And let's give some credit to Hyde and Corporal there. That's good work. Well, yeah, it is good work because actually when you're playing against this team of Axes from the uh, perspective of Dead Nation Focus Me, Carthus isn't realistically going to gank you in the early game. So this pressure has been pure 2v2. Steel was not around the bot lane. Obviously, we saw him go towards the top there. And we see a two-level advantage in the top lane still. Uh, uh, grass yeah. doesn't even land. Oof. Yeah, Hyde and Corporal just really abusing the power of Aphelios in lane and Thrash as well. We've seen a couple of really good Thrash performances so far. Saw the likes of Proud do really well on that. And obviously, 
Gang himself. A really good thrash. We saw that in the finals of the uh, summer split last year. But mm, guess where Steel is, my friend? He's back to our plane. Of course he is. Um, but this is going to concede a Mountain Drake to the side of Axes in uh, in the bottom half of the map. I think they're probably happy with that trade. The yeah, because they're forcing on again. So good, and he's so far down. He's now coming in. He's going to see if he can steal some Krugs at least. He gets... No, he doesn't, he gets, doesn't even get one. That's just uh, sad. He's, he's just looking to uh, poke, I guess. <laughs> uh, that is the Drake secure, though, for Axis. So at least they found some area of pressure. Um, but, as we're saying, we're looking at... Uh, Utapon and Gang taking Krugs down at the bot side as well. So even they're kind of some way to get a little bit of CS with the wave in an awkward position for them. Yeah, so because Gragas is taking uh, the top, the red quadrant of Hoglet right now, it does mean that uh, they're trying to dissuade any kind of counter jungling from Hoglet to go into that bot side, taking the Krugs, as we said. Predator just popped from Steel there, see if they're looking for see a fight. Well, the face breaker stun again, that's really well done. That's oh, a great wow. suplex. So much damage now. Hoglet's in trouble. Doesn't have level 6, so even if he dies, he's done. He's going to flash forward for the W, but doesn't matter. Yutaseros is there. That's another kill now for Ebi. And Uinyan is on low HP as well. He's got a pop, but that's it. Yeah, I thought with both flashes available that the top side of Axis might be able to dis uh, disengage from that gank. But of course, the showstopper is ready and available. Ebi just punting this poor card, this poor Mordekaiser back into the team. Doesn't matter how many flashes the Axes have, they both uh, they both get punished for that. Flash is now gone from the both of them, and obviously the card is dying. Yeah, and I was getting a bit worried there because I saw Corporal coming with the Moby Boots, maybe a bit of a turnaround, but decides better against so, it. There's a massive Yeah, so at this point lead. we think, okay, right, well, what can actually realistically these guys do? We see another minion stun with the face breaker. Unyan immediately flashing out, but the haymaker catching the both of them. Hoglet, uh, with respect to him, trying to flash forward, get those dark harvest stacks, and see if he can take down steel. But a flash in kind from the Gragas sees him out safely. That is level six now ticked over for this Karthus. Mm -hmm. He's died the once, so not hor horrendous. We've seen Karthus end up really punished in the early game, but on the other side, yeah. set is 2 0. Gragas has got the two kill involvements, and their top laner is on life support. So we'll have to see whether Karthus can start oh, to impact and, the map uh, a little bit more. Utapon taking the red buff because Steel had just taken Hoglitz as well. And one of the things about Karthus is that he is really good at farming, mm. but he can only farm if there are camps available. So if you're take if you're going into his jungle, normally the response is, well, I'm going to go into your jungle. But that's why DFM's bot lane did back off and take the Krogs, stuff like that. A very valuable camp. It means that there's just less stuff for this Karthus to feed himself on. And that's another plate now for everybody who's yeah. taken three in this top side. Uh, at oh. least Yuan Yan has at least hit level 6 now, has got the Death Realm available to him. I'm not sure he wants to bring Set into it, however. Um, and <laughs> it's it right. still a two-level lead. Yeah, uh, Ebby taking a lot of tower shots there, just evening up the trade. But he's a good 25 CS in. Steel now has the Herald taken as well. See which tower he wants to put that towards. Might try and dunk on top lane yet again and make this Mordekaiser as unhappy as physically possible. To anybody who's not seen the uh, the really good LEC little infomercial infographic of the how to use the Rift Herald, it does about 2,000 true damage, and as it comes in to take this turret, it will be doing about two plates worth of damage, and there's two plates exactly left. Two. Yeah, it does exactly So two this is a worth. really efficient bit of Rift Herald usage. Goodbye, top lane turret. First turret blood over to DFM yeah. and set. So that's, <laughs> oh, jumping onto Cirrus again. So yeah, this he is, is just uh, the, you know, the, the Tristana lane here. It takes about Half the HP of Cyrus, just a little under there as well. But Gaudiario not really finding much out of this Trastana pick. You know, we did talk about it in Champion Select. Uh, we've been a little quiet on it, mostly because the camera hasn't been there. There haven't been that many trades. It's it's dead even in CS. There's just not really been much to talk about there. And that CS lead, which had been there in bot lane, has now shrunk to just five, if that, with the waves coming in. So that's good work there from the bot lane. Good. So, um, so even the thing that was going kind of well for Axis is starting to kind of... Go back, shift back towards neutral as well. Corporal, though, in this bush trying to keep them away from the wave. But I think that was a cannon miss as well. Come on, you Dupont, you got to do better than that. <laughs> I, was, I didn't actually catch that. I was looking a little bit at the minimap there, just seeing uh, well, what was seeing happening across 3v3. the map. 3v3. Oh. Uh, we're looking at Hoglet Court there, and we're seeing Corporal now hooked in by this Nautilus. There is but the stopwatch is there, but here comes the depth charge, and Steel is here as well. Oh, oh good backstep on that. Explosive cask. Yeah, I thought the body slam would come in there just for a bit of CC first, but no. Corporal backsteps the explosive cask, and that's a very dangerous trade for the likes of DFM to take because even if Hoglet doesn't show up there, he does have the jungle item completed. I was going to talk about this a little bit earlier, but Karthus only really becomes this real menace once he has his jungle item available. So him assuming that the Dark Harvest and the Runic Echoes pops on his ultimate it means he just does so much much damage to these low HP targets. So when you take those big trades there, if you get one person low, Carthus can finish off the kill very easily. Yeah, but 
Wait, is it the cost of a stopwatch? Th Corporal has I'm no flash. Again. Stopwatch, we're seeing another jump in here with the rocket jump from Sarah. And that's going to be a lot of I damage now close. from this ultimate. Oh, he gets him! That's a great combo, but it is at the cost of Tristan. Great roam up from Steel and Gang to trade that back. But it's a hook onto Gang now. Hoglet's there, Flay's there. We've got this wall of pain slow, and that's a good dark passage in for Hyde, but he's going to get out his Gang Ooh, with so a close. good dredge line. Yeah, uses up the ignite there as well. But fantastic, good. A, a little bit of coordination there from Axis. Just saying, hey, Hoglet, I could use that, uh, that orbital bar bombardment right about now. I'd love better as a skin for Carthus actually. But yeah, well played by Gariado to know the damage limits, knows that the Buster shot for the extra damage and the extra order there would get uh, get Cirrus low enough for Hoglet to finish him off with the Requiem. The macro round span up and Carthus manages to claim a kill on the mid lane and manages to get the second Drake. Uh, that's an old school Halo yeah. Wars reference. That was that's mainly for me that. and Nymera yeah, here. <laughs> so we see here, Cirrus not quite a full HP. Gets jumped on. The full combo used from Gaudiado. Ignite committed as well. Goes down to about 300 HP in which the Dark Harvest and the Pop uh, makes short work of the rest of that karma. But yeah, good cleanup from Gang and Steel just to finish off Gaudiado. It means that the assist does go through to Cirrus as well. He's built up two Doran's Rings and a Seek's Arm Guard, which means that maybe the next all-in will be a little bit more difficult. And it also means the stopwatch is available whenever that Carthus Requiem is wanting to be channeled, so you well, can kind of potentially stop that. Ah, but not available yet. Not available so we'll yet. we'll see so. when that full item is built up, or the stopwatch is bought. Currently a full inventory for Cirrus, so not available to buy that stopwatch just yet. Uh, and I do respect the double control ward buy over the stopwatch. Vision control is important right now, especially as we're seeing Axis once again have an okay early game. Like the top side has gone yep. horrifically wrong. But we've seen Carthus pull out a couple drakes. We've seen the bot lane do pretty well, though they are now in even CS. And Gary Arrow putting off a nice sort of setup kill there in the mid lane. Too. I, I mean, it is still a two and a half thousand gold lead yes, for 13 it is. minutes. So while I think that Gary Arrow is doing okay on this Tristan, I think that Hoggle is doing okay. But there's no real, real advantage for this. Another hook That's, goes yeah. wide. Yeah, it goes wide because the minion wave's there. This is, you know, j just one of the things about uh, hook champions is that normally you don't want to be throwing them into a minion wave because there are so many extra ways to shield yourself, allow those minions to tank the CC up for you. Indeed, and you're right, it's two and a half gold lead, and it's a trinity force Ooh, complete passes. for this set, and we're seeing a bit of a trade here using the shield from the Dark Passage, but now he's stuck, he's got the mm. Moon, the Inferno Mult, but that wasn't fantastic, and Just Utapon has his ult available still, that means that this bot lane has got the summon oh, or the Hoglet, uh, ultimate advantage, Hoglet has put down the Wall of Pain, but Steel is here. Really going to level up now on Steel. Somehow, some way that cast was not quite Ooh. wide, and Hyde has to flash with a very good dredge line from Gang. But here we go. Predator has been popped. Body slam flash is available, but so is the Dark Passage, and Hoglet gets out. Yes, the explosive cast used early into the trade there, just trying to force Ho Hoglet into an unfortunate position. Hoglet now actually is see Ooh. We're seeing a good hook there. There is a stopwatch available from Steel. Has got it, but Hoglet doesn't have Requiem quite available. He does available. have the stopwatch in case he wants to channel it. I don't think it's a good trade normally to for have a to, for a stopwatch into Requiem. There. So, you know, just going to take the chunk as well. It means that Gragas has to recall. Um, and that's a very important thing because Hoglet is currently actually a level behind on CS. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah no. Oh, that's a lot of damage coming through. It's a grasp, and that's a suplex away from the tower, and it's a slow with that death as well. Oh, they are in the death realm. Unyan is under tower. He's thinking, what can I do here? He can't even oh. get that, and that's just a solo kill for Ebi. It's a solo kill with a Triforce completed due to... I'm sorry, this, this Unyan on Mordekaiser is on absolute just death watch here he doesn't know what he's doing um with these items it's just so sad he just doesn't have any way to fight or stat check this set at the moment and we watch set go and just randomly take raptors as well this carthus who wants to farm is losing his jungle to set invades at this point it's three and oh for this terrifying set yeah. the man named shrimp isn't getting battered this time he's doing the <laughs> battering uh, and that's a lot of work done in this top side yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so this is one of the games where set first pick has definitely worked out. It's good. We we said it was a good blind pick, but it does do well into a lot of melee matchups as well. But thing is though, like normally this matchup is not necessarily so one sided. But the early trades from Ebi and then zoning off of Unyan uh, meant that this Mordecai could really never get to the point where he could trade with this set effectively. You see, like he's got a Kindle gem and boots right now Ugh. compared to the full Triforce, one of the strongest single items in the game when completed, and also similar boots. So he doesn't even have a move speed advantage against his top lane opponent. Yeah, and Steel picks up the second Rift Herald. So it's been two Drakes for two Rift Heralds traded. And actually, Gragas, as I said, has a CS lead and a level lead now on this Carpus, which we were saying was going to be hard farming. So you can sort of see how little of Hoglet's jungle he's been able to get hold of the last few minutes. Yeah. And also the other thing is that because um, we have 
Moby's on the Nautilus, and Abby can push in for literally, literally for forever on this top side. It means that if you try and go for an aggressive play on Galliadu and try and follow up with the Requiem, there's going to be someone from DFM available to try and shut you down and clean you up, as as uh, is what happened with the first kill on Syros. But DFM are done giving over easy drakes to Axis. They're here to contest for vision, and the Ocean Drake on this Ocean Rift will be spawning in 20 seconds. Uh, Hyde's ultimate, the Moonlight Vigil, is back up now after that earlier use. That's great, but man. Steel has got a lot of damage. There's a lot of ultimates available for both sides. In fact, I think all of them are up. So this could be a very apocalyptic team fight. Should all the R buttons be pressed? Yeah, literally every summoner but Hyde's flash on this Aphelios is is ready and available for this uh, dragon fight. We see Ebi has worked his way down here, walked his way down, didn't use, use hasn't used the teleport yet. Hook just missing that. Yeah, but as I said, the big difference here is the fact that's a level 11 double uh, rank 2 ultimate from maybe just the level 9 of this very anemic Mordekaiser. Uh, actually, what we see here is that because DFM had the positioning, there's no real threat for Axis to go towards that dragon themselves. So DFM wants to summon the Herald and then maybe move down towards the dragon afterwards. But they're going to do a lot of damage onto this turret while they're doing it, and that hook does go wide. But while they're dealing with the Rift Herald, they're going to go back towards this dragon and see whether they continue this. But Axis are here it's pretty swiftly afterwards, but they have to come through a pretty small jungle corridor. And this Karma has got a lot of a couple items yeah. to make poke from those mantra cues really stick. Okay, and while Axes uh, did trade a couple of early dragons uh, for the pressure onto the top side, so they currently have two dragons, um, they're just uh, trading back the Ocean Drake onto DFM there, so it's now two to one in the dragon score. It is an Ocean Rift, we hadn't mentioned that before. I, I did mention it quickly, oh, but, I was, case, but it was when uh, I was talking about the Ocean Drake being summoned. But it was uh, part right, of right. a larger conversation, so it's worth focusing on. I'll give you that. Yeah. Uh, and actually, looking down at the spot lane, it's now somehow some way of five CS leads for this misfortune, which was down 15. Yeah, I think it's just the, the pressure afforded by Ebby and then, you know, all the attention which the vision and roaming has to go towards that top lane. It just bleeds out into the rest of the CS leads and across the map, really. And we're looking at mid lane tower now taken for DFM as well. They've yeah. got two towers, including this mid lane turret. And they've picked up a Drake as well. Axis are starting to bleed a lot of objectives. Yeah, they're bleeding a lot of objectives, and the items are starting to come in to really uh, bring themselves some counterplay to the kill combos of Axis. We see Azonia's coming in from Syros. We see a stopwatch built up on steel. And of course, Set has his Haymaker anyway, so he doesn't need anything. It's a 5,000 gold lead. It's absolutely huge. They have two towers. They have a massive 50 CS lead in the top lane. They have the lead in the kills as well. They got all the plates onto the top lane tower as well. So that's a lot of different sources of gold income. Yeah, it is. And actually, we're looking at this top side item discrepancy. Well, it's a Trinity Force and a Joram's Fist to Dude, literally a Hextech Pistol. Belt stuff. Like, and a Kindle Gem. It's not even a Proto Belt. And that's a cheap uh, item. Uh, it's an expensive Trinity Force versus a non-complete Proto Belt. Yeah, and also the problem with the Proto Belt is that it's normally a bit of an early snowball item. This is this guy is anything but snowballed. You're really not going to get the maximum value out of that item. But I guess he'd already started building towards it and then just has to complete the item, really. Yeah, and I can also understand a little bit more mobility versus this set that's been running at him all game. Maybe can yeah. avoid the face breaker with a good use of the active. Yeah, maybe. Uh, it does help you a little bit with your team fighting, but when you're team fighting at uh, this uh, disadvantage, you're lower level than the AD carry. You're actually only one level over the enemy support. It's really pretty bad news, Bears for Inyan. Yeah, and the CS lead in the jungle continues to grow for Steel as well, which is probably showing again a little bit more. That's probably a good indicator of the fact that Axis and Hoglet are kind of using or losing, rather, a lot of control over their jungle. Hoglet finding it difficult to continue the early farm lead he had originally picked up. Uh, as my caster continues to debate what's going on, Seros yeah. picks up a blooper. Uh, and Set now found his way back into a matchup with his Mordekaiser, much to Uinyan's dismay. Yeah, so no, at least the proto belt has been finished for in yeah, now. He just finished that first item, uh, whereas Ebby well on his way to a second. We do see a couple of items coming in for the side of Axis, though. Blade of the Ring came been completed for a little while for Gaudiaru on Tristana in the mid lane. Essence Reaver similarly completed for Hyde and also Yudupon. Alright, well, so we've been a little bit 
despairing of where Axis are in this game, but what options do they have to get back into it? How do they win this from this position? Uh, well, if the game can stall out, they do have a Tristana in terms of the scaling, and they have this double AD carry composition, and then you can also take away the set into the Death Realm if you think he's going to be too much of a problem and bring too much disruption to a team fight. So perhaps we can see these AD carries pop off eventually into this game, and then obviously Karthus scales pretty well. The problem is, I just don't think that DFM are going to give him the chance to scale anyway. We see another 300 gold going over to Evie, another kill effectively, and he already was the recipient of all the plates in the top lane like we said and now another fresh turret as well so this guy is very very high, far ahead of his counterpart now onto a pretty much a 60 cs lead now even further up than the 50 we saw before yeah and uh, of course we're looking at across a couple bounties now for dfm of course unsurprisingly this set is yeah. big for the 300 gold but it's matched by misfortune has got a 300 gold lead as well oh sorry 300 gold bounty rather yeah. uh off the back of a cs lead she's managed to get out of nowhere uh and uh is now a bf sword ahead of Aphelios as well. Yeah, well well on the way to the Infinity Edge, and that'll be really, really scary for Axis at that point. I really don't know if you can afford to team fight this DFM comp. I think maybe the way that Axis has to win is through a Baron steal, but that's I don't know if DFM even need Baron to win when Ebby is so far ahead in the sideline. I think they're pretty happy to scale up themselves, obviously. I think that uh, they don't want to let, let the game go too late, but Ebby's Fortune, as we said, is one of these S-tier AD carries alongside the Aphelios, and uh, Youth Pond is a very good AD carry in his own right. He can pilot that pick very well. Uh, Hoglet has ticked over to level 11 though, so it is a rank 2 Requiem available, so maybe that can be used, but now Steel's got a Predator Ganger, that's so oh, much damage, so Hoglet damage. just gets nuked this AP damage, oh, oh. just what? He's gone! The Explosive Cast explodes, Karthus and the Master of Death or one of them at least, is now actually dead. Well, Predator does damage apparently. Hoglet says, hey, I've got a Dark Harvest. Steel says, I don't care. I have my boots with some shiny enchants on them. Just one shots Hoglet. I think that might have even been a solo kill. I didn't see if there was any assist. I think it was. Assist <laughs> tagged onto that. But this Maybe Seros yeah. got a shield in. So Hoglet uh, kind of forgot that the river is not a place which is safe for him. He's uh, but a lowly Karthus, doesn't have any of those escapes and definitely does not have the gold lead to start brawling against the likes of this Gragas. Yep, and uh, that was a little unfortunate. This, that was impressive stuff from Stu. 2-0-2, he's got a Zonius completed, he's got pen boots completed. This guy really stings. Like... And actually, what, what, a, what an interesting couple of games we've seen from Steel so far. Like, we see the first two games on Jarvan, we thought that this guy was fantastic as an initiator. And now we're seeing another pick from him, playing a similar role in terms of being the playmaker, but on a different style of champion completely. So very well played from Steel in this game so far. And with the Karthus off the map, it means it's an easy second Ocean Drake picked up for DFM, who, you know, what Set really needs when he's versus this Mordekaiser? <laughs> More healing. <laughs> I hadn't even thought about that. Yeah, pretty much this this set will never be on any kind of low HP if you leave him alone. Uh, after, leave him out of combat for a little while. He'll re regen up very, very quickly. Yep, and that's a little bit sad. And Gang's here to contest some of this vision in the Dragon Pit. Just going to walk away, though, would be a little bit by himself. Uh, and we're also just sort of thinking about it as well. We're looking at... Um, a bit, here, a bit of conversation around Greg as well. And like, actually, in a lot of ways, he resembles Karthus in that he has that nuke ability with the current build. So it's not quite the same, of course, but with his ultimate, can kind of do a similar blow up a team with his ultimate. We kind of saw that, that lot of damage. Um, we have obviously, he plays a very, very, very different role in the early game and also into team fights as well. Because, you know, if he does lose out on farm and lose out on levels, he's still a disruptor. He can still throw out the yes. ultimate, still use the body slam, tie up an important carry for the rest of his team to do some damage. Whereas Karthus only really ever brings damage. Uh, we see now that Hoglet has built himself up to the, the first pen item in the Oblivion Orb. Uh, so, you know, he will be doing, still doing some decent damage. We see a hook just being thrown yep. out, but still getting away from that. Of course, and of course, but what it does mean is that between an explosive cast versus the Requiem, we're going to have a lot of AP AoE damage coming out of these two junglers, and there's both level rank 2 ultimates available, so these next team fight, if it ever turns up, uh, could end with a lot of very low health balls very quickly. But I've got to feel that Axis are going to want to try and avoid this and stall out as much as they can for that scaling we've been talking about. But yeah. it's going to be hard work. And the thing is, though, I look at the team card from Axis and I think that actually, who is not a prey to the barrel? Maybe Mordecai could put put himself into the death realm, at least by himself sometime. But then it's really only Gadiadu with the rocket jump. Maybe he can buffer that. Um, oh, is uh, going just pulled back by the hook. Some interesting drag mechanics there. The, the bungee cord going on there between yeah. the two <laughs> hook abilities. Yeah. Uh, and now we see DFM just doing their due diligence, putting down the wards. There's no wards uh, literally beyond their own side of the jungle, not even in their own side of the jungle now. 
that's um, a massive vision control lead yeah, we could absolutely. see of about you know nearly 10 percent at this point is 10 percent at this point and we're seeing the baron start and gary are you and axis have to think about contesting this it's going to be tricky they don't have a lot of face checkers their mordekaiser isn't tanky enough for it really it's um, corporal it's not there either He's not. Uh, Hogler, of course, is now in the mid laners round. But oh, we're seeing shield. A, a mantra shield here. We're going to see Gang stream forward. Has got the dead. Oh, he he drops it. Indeed, he drops, stops the uh, rocket jump. But Gary Ogu flashes away, and that's going to be the end of that engagement. Oh, man. He actually interrupts the Tristana W there, then gets away the flash for the for the style of that play. So yeah, now Gario going into these next couple of fights won't even have that flash available. And he was already, oh, was he Evie looking for a flank here? He yeah, might be able to shut He's got flash, he's got knock, he's got, he's got, he's got the, not, the face breaker and he's got the suplex full. Hide now flashing away, but Evie's in a tricky spot, but it doesn't matter because Tristan has been detonated and so has Carthus. But now Carthus is alive oh. in the middle of this. That's a massive bullet time, but we're gonna see a huge Requiem come through, but it's not enough damage. Hide is on the side trying to do as much damage with the Inferno as he can, but Corporal now running away, the sole survivor of his team. Gying is the only one who goes down for DFM. Oh, Ebby finding a great flank there. Once again, interrupting someone in passage. Someone, I, I think it was uh, Hyde that took the lantern and was actually subsequently showstoppered into the wall. It buys them a four for one, including the jungler. So this will be a free Baron take as it's only Corporal left alive to see the Baron go down. Yeah, Corporal just about survives. He's the sole member, but somehow, somewhere, I think Misfortune picked up three kills in that fight as well. Yeah, Absolutely terrifying bullet time. Okay, so we're going back into this replay here, and Ebby already knows that this is a good flank. Axe is not positioning correctly to do this. A good showstopper once again interrupts the Tristana W. The rocket jump is interrupted for the second time in as many minutes. Hyde once again also uh, put into a bit of a difficult situation as well. And Wild Carthus is actually doing some decent damage here, threatening to finish off a couple of members of the team. Hyde is just shut down by the duo of Syros and Ebi at the end of that fight, leading to a now 9-2 kill score and a 9k gold lead. Yes, it is. And at this point, Axis, I think this is it. We had some mild hopes that maybe, maybe, maybe you could scale, but I don't think you're going to get the chance versus this set that has three items. And this. an ATCS lead. Yeah, we're looking at this Misfortune with two and a half. We're looking at this Karma, this Gragas with items as well. It's a stone plate, a Nautilus, for crying out loud. You can't even kill the man, that man anymore. Yeah, Gang was the one person to go down in that last fight and decides, yeah, I'm not going to die again. Builds up the stone plates. Uh, I've, I've probably had that for the last fight as well, but yeah, obviously the Nordlist very tanky at this point and Axis, I really don't see a way for them into this game now. I think they've been a uh, well and truly out fought this game by DFM, although they had a good laning phase. It's a uh, little too little too late to try and think about fighting back into this game at this point. And there's not many flashes available. That means AD carry stepping forward to destroy these waves is going to be a risk. DFM spinning off into a 1 3 1. Seras has gone to the top side. Set has taken the turret in the bot side. And the shove continues. And if there's a team I can think that will be able to pull off a D uh, 1 3 1 with Baron, got to be DFM. They, well, they also have the gold lead for it, right? Because <laughs> you can't shut down this set. Well, they're going to try. try that's, a, that's a death realm. Set's now trapped here, but he's, he he's not. Are you trapped in here with he? He's got an ult. He's still thinking about getting people out of this. He's now going to run away. He's got to slow down from this, but he's going straight back in. So much damage, and that's a massive oh, haymaker wow. that has to be flashed away from by Uinyan, but I don't know if it's an idea. Um, Evie finally goes down, but it means that in the mid lane, uh, Steel nearly goes down as well. Somehow, somehow. Oh, oh Steel, goodbye. What happened? Was it a tanking of the tower? Uh, I'm not entirely sure, but it ends up somehow. As a two for none for Axis, just as I said, oh, they don't have a way back into this game. Well, the way back into the game is you wait for a mistake, and mistakes were made. Ebby, I think, maybe could have gotten out of that situation if he actually paths a bit further towards the enemy base and then uses the showstopper to buy a bit more difference, a uh, bit more distance, rather. But it was a 1v4 in which he's not really uh, strong enough to do just yet. Maybe another right man you can try and think about that. But oh, that, as we say that, it did mean the base was broken. The top uh, inhibitor turret goes down. The top inhibitor goes down. So it's not a complete wash for DFM. It was a nice response from Axis. And what this also means is that Axis get themselves onto Drake Point. They have three dragons now. They pick themselves up an Ocean Soul, uh, Ocean Dragon, which puts them in place if they get one more to get the Ocean Soul. If they manage to steal an Ocean Soul, if DFM uh, allow the game to go on that long, Axis may have found themselves a way into this game. Yes, you might be right, but we'll have to see. I 
want to know what happened to Steel to get him so low. Was it just Gary Aru jumping on him? What happened? I saw an Ignite, so I think it probably was Gary Aru there. Um, I don't know whether it was because they went for a kill combo under the tower. Uh, hopefully we'll see a bit of a replay of some of those plays there because they were... Uh, some pretty unfortunate plays there. And yeah, I think that while Steel has had a fantastic first two going on three games in this one as well, he has, uh, in each of those games, had a, an interesting moment, a happy moment, some might say, and that might have been Steel's moment for this game. Yeah, a little bit early on the stopwatch there. We'll have to see what happens. But good work from Gary Arrigo, if that was who it was jumping on there, and a Requiem cleanup, exactly what we were worried about, exactly what was threatened by this Axis composition. But DFM still shoving. I've got this wave being pushed in the top side, and Tristana has to be there to deal with it so it means it's a 4v5 or a 4v4 rather cassettes pushing in this bot side yeah and while all of those players went down at least the top lane inhibitor went down for uh for axes which means that dfm do have some pressure to work around uh they do i think probably now they want to wait until the baron spawns i think that they don't particularly want to take a straight 5v5 without any of these objectives available no so no sense in fighting for the sake of fighting Indeed. Uh, we are looking, however, at a Storm Razor picked up for this misfortune. Yeah, that's well. really strong. Never mind the Bloodthirst. It's just yeah. going to be all the damage all the time. Yeah, it that, that bullet first, time uh, that, 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 that first tip, that first tap, the first the first auto is going to be 75% uh, crit with an extra BF sword on top of uh, it as well. But Misfortunes love taps as well. That first auto on a target yeah. does additional damage. So if you've got that on top of a Storm Razor as well, that all combined is going to be most of someone's health Yeah, and, and with also the, the, the good chance that it crits as well. Obviously, the extra damage doesn't crit on it. Uh, actually, sta Static Shiv does have the ability to crit. That's the only extra on hit proc which has the ability to do so. Yeah. But, uh, I believe double, I believe Misfortune's double up actually counts as uh, oh, really? applying her passive as well. So I think you can actually double up for that. And with that, on top mm. of the Storm Razor, maybe. I'm not entirely sure on the interaction. So I have to check that out. I'm not a Misfortune player myself. I'll have to look up that interaction myself. I, um, I, I play her occasionally, but badly. Yeah. So. Actually, it looks like Youthpon is working his way towards a GA. It looks like has the stopwatch and imagery as well. Well, no, no, none of those wards. No, don't need those wards when you're pushing over to the enemy base. They can only be in one place, and you can see it on the screen at all times. Indeed, that's exactly it. Um, you just battle with the opponent, and honestly, that's a yep. pretty strong vision line straight across like the top half of uh, Axis's jungle. As Ebi takes away a blue buff here as well, Hoglet's yeah. desperately farming yeah, walls actually, over the actually, wall. He actually, he thinks he's not safe enough to go into the wolf pit, so he just farms it over the wall. Can't quite kill the big one. And you know, while we're talking about Axis, not really. You know, we did, we were briefly saying they they didn't have a way back into this game, and this game is make no mistake in DFM's favor, but Hyde does have three and a half items. You know, this guy is on the Aphalia, something which we've seen 100% presence of. No one really likes playing against that pick you, unless you have a power pick to bring out against it yourself. And this is where we see the vision control absolutely come in. Like we were saying, 42% Axes, Axes uh, just being stuck in their base, they really can't walk up to a lot of these objectives. You know, everywhere on the map they have to scroll, here be monsters, here be DFM. And it does look like DFM are starting up the Baron. It's a two-man Baron, and Misfortune certainly has the AD. There's honey fruit available, so Steel won't necessarily get lower enough for a Requiem uh, deletion, but I don't think Axis even really realized this is happening right now. It's down to 2,000 HP, and that is it. Level up there, nearly <laughs> put a spanner in the works, yeah. but no, that's it. Ocean Drake spawning in a minute, which Axis might want to contest for. It would be the Ocean Soul, which would be a big boon for them. On the other hand, are they even going to get the opportunity? This is I, probably like, well, this is likely to be the death. I, I genuinely think that the only way to win the game is stealing the Dragon Soul. And even then, if they die in the process of taking it, it is obviously game over because there is an inhibitor down in the top lane. No real defensive structures to speak of for the side of Axis' base. Yeah, and actually we do see that Youth Pond just ticked over to 445 AD with a good 75% crit chance as well. This Misfortune is so, 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 so strong. Two levels up on Hyde as well on this Aphelios, even though he's rocking the three and a half items, just building towards the Bloodthirster as yeah, well. Yeah, there is still room for Aphelios to throw out one of those Moonlight Vigils, get a grouped up Inferno Malt or something, or maybe a good Gravity Malt for the Roots, and we could see a team fight go the way of Axis yet. Yeah, and they do have the secondary back liner of Gadiaru on the Tristana as well. Actually slightly behind in items, if not levels. It is level 17 compared to Hyde's level 15. But uh, yeah, Galeado does have some ability with the extra range which Tristana's passive gives her as she levels up as well. Maybe it's trying to outplace some of these team fights. We saw the Observer give us a little bit of a heads up. There is a ward by the Gromp. Ward for access to teleport to if they did want to try and find that fight. But so far, not pulling that trigger. And instead, we're seeing pressure in the two waves. The inhibitor has respawned in the top side at least, but it's a 3-2 th split for DFM and the wave pushing in the top side as well. 
Yeah, and this is really going to be... Looks like they're just pushing towards the Death Pusher, trying to take down this last inhibitor. Well, no, the second to last inhibitor turret, as Ebi takes down the inhibitor in the top lane. Yeah, daring people to come and try and 1v4 him again. Maybe this time it'll go his way. We'll find out the uh, tower Ow. just about gone. Hoglet takes half his HP to an incidental barrel from Steel. And uh, Ebi now in the mid lane takes down that one too. And we're looking at all inhibitors about to go down. We're seeing a hook onto steel. That might be a, bit a great hide. shield. And actually that bullet time was absolutely disgusting. Hyde just disappeared. And now Utapon is 1v1 in Gariaru. And Orinyan is in the death realm with Seros. But Seros Oof. has stopwatch and Nautilus destroys the Mordecai. So for a double oh, kill. So and that's so much set. damage now coming in. We're going to see finally Miss... Um, so <laughs> Well, we see a Requiem come through, but it's not enough. And that's going to be game now for DFM, who Clean it out closely after a cl cleanly rather after a last ditch event from Axis in their base on their first Baron push. Yes, yeah, another day at the office for DFM, and they're going to start off one and zero on this week two of the LJL Spring Split 2020. So, Lexi, what did you make of that game? Well, that was kind of what i expected but it wasn't at the same time axis really showed up they're actually showing they've got some pedigree corporal really impressed me that game honestly he really impressed me like while he he wasn't as impactful as i was hoping he definitely did show up which was definitely an impressive performance and axis is definitely showing me some hope but obviously dfm and cyros flexing on them haters like just defiance right that was yeah yeah well it's, like i said it's just kind of a day at the office for dfm they had a really good team comp pulled out the gragas like i've been wanting to see from all the ljl teams looks like they have prioritized the j4 when it's available for them uh, in the first two games in week one but obviously when that was banned away castile had such um a good uh, couple of games on that um but yeah so yeah still i think had a really good game and then obviously ebby on the set just made this mordekaiser just utterly useless I yeah. mean, that's just kind of the nature of how that kind of goes sometimes, right? I mean, when you get zoned out at level 1 that hard, it's into a dive when you're like level 4 to level 2 or something. That is just the worst of situations. If you blow your teleport to get back to lane, you're still not at any item advantage. You're still getting out traded by the set, and it just never really recovered. Because it's not like Carthus can bail out your lanes that hard. And it was hitting the point, right, where set was invading onto... Raptors from top lane, finding Urinyan, coming to see what was going on, then him getting solo killed despite putting the Death Realm down. It was looking pretty ugly in that top side. Uh, and then towards the later stage of the game, Utapon hit all the items, items on that on misfortune, and every bullet time uh, destroyed people's lives. Really hurt. Really hurt. <laughs> well, and that's what they're meant to do, right? They are meant to kind of just combo wombo in in some fashion, and then they had this split push that just went on for so long and that was ebby kind of giving a master class on hey this is how you split push this is how you play the four one this is how you play three one yeah this he was... did get shut down the one time but it took four v one people, and they got to take four... top they got to take yeah they got top... to take the inhibit for it yeah, yeah. yeah. And... The, the only the only slight thing there was steel getting caught out and that's allowing yeah. uh access to go claim uh that uh, the that ocean gate which put them on soul point but actually i do want to give credit there to gary Aru, who did find the the rocket jump ignite on to steel Put him into that position where Rekum could finish him off. Yeah, so actually, actually a little bit of credit for Axis for finding at least some way back into the game. Actually, the laning phase from the TV2 from, from Axis was also pretty okay, considering that they had a jungler which couldn't affect their lane at all, right? So I think Hyde and Corporal did okay. I think, I think, I think I'm, I'm a little, little bit suspect on Hyde's positioning in team fights. We saw in the last fight in the base, he did kind of just walk forward and into a Nautilus hook and then just got instantly deleted by the bullet time. So, I, and we saw this a little bit with the Syndra when he was ahead in their second game of the split when he was on the Syndra. got caught out by the Gragasol a couple of times in that game. So I think Hyde, my homework for you is to just be a little bit more aware of the displacement abilities the enemy team has available to deal with you. I think that you're doing well in lane, keep it up, but you know, just try and translate that into safer team fighting. The DFM, fantastically well played on the front foot once again. And with that all in mind, we will have to go on a very short break. But right after that break, we'll be coming back with another game from DFM, who will be facing the Rascal Jester. Thank you so much for watching so far, and we'll be right back after this break.